Well, good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to day three of Genetic Genealogy Ireland 2018, Dublin. Um, a big thank you, first of all, to our sponsors for these DNA lectures, Family Tree DNA, who have kindly sponsored us for the last six years and continue to do so, uh, hopefully long into the future. Um, I'd also like to thank uh, my colleagues, uh, my fellow speakers, who have uh, kindly donated and volunteered their free time to come and talk to you for the entire weekend. Um, we are all members of ISOG, the International Society of Genetic Genealogy, and uh, it's open to anybody, so please feel free to join. There's a, an excellent uh, Facebook group, there's an excellent uh, Wikipedia page uh, where you can find out anything about DNA that you are afraid to ask. So uh, it gives me pleasure to introduce our first speaker for this uh, morning. It is Martin McDowell. Now Martin is with the North of Ireland Family History Society where he is Education Development Officer. And they are doing sterling work in the North of Ireland, uh, coordinating the activities of a variety of different branches. And they have a DNA project that has over 2,500 people, which approximately covers about 25% of the ancestors that people would have had in Northern Ireland in the 1750s. Absolutely incredible work. Please give a warm welcome to Martin McDowell. Hello, thanks very much indeed. Uh, this presentation is going to be about Lazarus. Can I just ask, has everybody in here or anybody in here uploaded to Jedmatch yet? Yep. Yeah. And has anyone given a go to Lazarus to try it? few people. So what I'm going to do is give you a few tips about it, explain to you how it works and the benefits of it. So hopefully after this talk you're going to be able to go back and use it and see if it is, is going to produce something new for you. Okay, before you start with Lazarus you really have to do a bit of preparation and do a bit of work on your DNA. It's one of the tier one tools on GEDmatch. And what it allows you to do is to recreate the DNA of deceased people. But in order to do that, you have to have people to compare your own DNA with. So you have to test as many people as you can. As I said, it's one of the tier one tools. And what that means is that you, there's a small charge for it. It's $10 per month. And that $10 charge allows you, uh, allows you to create Lazarus kits. Only you are able to see the Lazarus kit so it doesn't go on to jet match for everyone else to match their kit against. <laughs> Start to follow that. So it is, a, it is a very good tool, but uh, there is that small charge. But once you have generated the kit, you can use it anytime you want to. So you don't pay to continually use the kit, you only pay for generating the kit. It works by comparison, and it's, uh, it's good to get as much information as you can before you start to use GEDmatch. So what I would recommend everyone does is to use tools to identify your matches, because you need to have common matches and get everybody uploaded onto GEDmatch for Lazarus to work effectively for you. So, <laughs> what is going on? Let me try and... Sorry about that. Yeah, that seems to be okay. Is that okay now? Yeah, we'll try. Right, we'll try again. So yes, using the chromosome browser, looking at your common matches and identifying how you're related to people is going to really help you. Then you have to put all of your DNA and any kits that you manage onto GEDmatch. <coughs> And you have to get other people to upload to GEDmatch as well. That's very important. So upload your DNA onto other sites, because if you go to other sites, you're going to find other matches. So if you've tested with companies, then test. Uh, if you've tested with Family Tree DNA, you can upload to MyHeritage. You can upload to GEDmatch, as I mentioned. You can also put your DNA onto Living DNA, which don't currently produce matches, but they will in the future. So if you put your DNA out in as many places as you can, you get more matches, then you can work out your connection to those matches and encourage them to upload to GEDmatch. And if you take that approach, it will help you to build Lazarus kits. So in order to get a good, robust family tree, I think that's very important. 
Because if you're going to work with Lazarus, and if you're going to work really just with your DNA, because these earlier slides aren't all about Lazarus, they're about trying to make a better job of working with your DNA, your autosomal DNA. So start to build up a family tree and use genealogy and compare that with your DNA matches. So target a particular family and try to work them down to the present day. Check your sources and make sure that you can find out as much about this particular family as you can, add as many descendants and then look at online trace and find all those people who have tested. If you find somebody on a tree and maybe you don't see a DNA match to them, it's a good idea to send them an email or a message and actually ask them, have they tested? And if they have tested, they may be able to tell you where it is and it may be under a different name that maybe you haven't recognised. It could be that they also have a DNA match to you and they haven't uploaded a tree or a surname, so therefore you don't recognise that, that that is the person at the moment. So get all that information together. As I said, use websites and DNA. Find as many of those people as possible. DNA Painter is a great tool for doing that because it can help you to identify. It helps you to look at your DNA and helps you to identify which bit of your DNA you got from specific ancestors. That's really, really useful. And particularly if you're going to be working with Lazarus, you're going to be trying to look at your DNA in a different way because you're going to be building a kit for your deceased ancestor. But DNA Painter is very good at helping you to identify the matches that then lead you to getting a good Lazarus kit. So, looking at other family members, as I said, that can be really, really useful. You, can, uh, you don't only get matches from your own DNA, you can also learn and get additional matches from family members. So if you have tested a cousin or a sibling, they will have got different blocks of DNA from different people that you, than you got. So you may have got one particular block from a, a particular ancestor, but maybe your brother or sister got a different block. And that would mean that they would have a match to a person that you wouldn't have a match to. So you're not gonna find a match to every fourth and fifth cousin, but the more people you thoroughly test within your family, the more of those fourth and fifth cousins you'll uncover, and the more you can put into your Lazarus kit. So you're gonna be using their DNA to identify other relatives who don't match you, as I just said there. So once you have matches, you're ready to do reconstruction on Lazarus. But before you do that, you have to get as many kits onto, onto GEDmatch as, as I said before. It is useful if the tests are all with the same company, but uh, they will work if they are with different companies as well. Okay, I've just put up a slide here, which is going to tell you about a particular family that I've been working on. This is my three times great grandparents. And it's just to give you an idea of how many people do descend from one particular couple. And this is just what I've found in my research so far. That's probably a typical family, uh, but there's more descendants even for myself to find. I'm one of those 192 three times great uh, grandchildren, but there's also people that are on different generations below me. So when I decided to make a Lazarus kit, I wanted to make a Lazarus kit for one of their descendants. And I was able to get DNA samples from people that from, were from the two times great grandchildren level down to the five times. Now obviously, when you're making the Lazarus kit, it's better to start with someone who is close in generation to you. So you're going to start maybe with generating the DNA of a parent or a grandparent. If you have your parents tested already, then you can work on grandparents. But in this instance that I'm going to demonstrate today, I actually managed to get a Lazarus kit for a great-grandparent. And she is actually one of the great-grandchildren of that particular couple. Sorry, she's one of the grandchildren of that couple because, yeah, she is my great-grandmother. So the advantage of Lazarus, and I'm sure you're wondering why you would go through all this, it's actually to get a higher match because if you think of DNA breaks down into smaller blocks with every generation. And conversely, what that means 
is that when you start to reconstruct the DNA of a deceased ancestor, it means that you're putting those, uh, those blocks together again. And it means that, in theory, your matches should have a stronger match to a Lazarus kit than what they do to your kit. So it starts to give you extra opportunities to find new matches. So this is how it works. As I said, start with a grandparent or with a parent. One thing, I'm, go I'm going to show you the actual fields that you have to fill out on Lazarus, but just before I mention that, uh, I just want to remember <coughs> to say to you that there is a spice field, which you can put, uh, well, you're supposed to be able to put a kit into, uh, a kit number, and that is supposed to help to generate the DNA of their partner. But it doesn't actually work. And it doesn't say that when you're using Lazarus. So it's just something to bear in mind. When you see the spice field, just ignore that. And when I mention that, I just want to also mention to you that there is a new tool that you may not be aware of called Map S Phasing. Has anyone heard of Map S Phasing? Yeah. There is explanatory uh, videos on YouTube about how it works. And I was having a look at them. There's less than 100 people have actually watched them yet. So I think it's a pretty new thing. And what it does is it allows you to use the DNA of descendants and one parent in order to produce a phase kit for the other parent. So that is doing what Lazarus was supposed to do, but currently doesn't do. So it's something to use and to experiment with if you want to do that, if you're in that uh, situation. But you have to have one of the parents and then some of the descendants. And what it does is it will compare the descendants against the parent and allow you to see what DNA they didn't get from that parent. And then it helps you to create a phase kit for the missing parent that you haven't currently got results for. So that's very useful. Uh, you need to have people in each group when you're creating a Lazarus kit or even on my best phasing, because it works by comparison. So what you're doing is you're comparing your DNA with other people to, to see which bits of DNA came from particular people. And the simplest example I can give you is if you think of your grandparents. Your grandparents gave DNA to all of their children who then passed them on to their grandchildren. So if you're testing yourself and you test your first cousin, what that means is that you and your first cousin share DNA because you got it from your common ancestors who are your grandparents. And that came through your parents so if you're going to recreate a kit for one of your parents, then you can do that by comparing your DNA to your cousin's DNA. Because any DNA that you share with your cousin obviously came through the parent that you're trying to recreate. So it's a different way of thinking about your DNA, but it's very logical and it does work. Okay, so you have to decide who you want to reconstruct a kit for. There is two different groups and you're going to be putting them into two different groups. The first group is the descendants of the person that you want to recreate or reconstruct. So if it's going to be a parent, it's going to be you and your siblings. So in that instance, it would be very useful to test as many of your siblings as possible because that will give you a bigger Lazarus kit and help you to get more matches towards it. So it's really worthwhile considering testing other people in the family. And now's a good time. Christmas is coming up. People are looking for Christmas presents. And, you know, there's nothing to stop you buying a couple of kits and giving them out to people. It's also a Christmas present for yourself. And it can be used to reconstruct this DNA. So in group two, group two is going to be people who are not direct descendants of the person who you're reconstructing. So if it's going to be your parents' kit, you're talking about cousins, second cousins, first cousins once removed. Those are the people that would be really useful because they're close relations who would still share a lot of common DNA with you and with your siblings. So what Lazarus is going to do is collect the shared DNA and compare them between those two groups. So you can put up to 10 people into group one and you can put up to 100 people in group two. So it's extremely useful. 
and that is how it's going to calculate the kit. So a full kit on Jetmatch works out at 3,587 units of DNA or centimorgans. So that's a complete kit. So you're not going to be able to probably complete a complete kit straight away, but you are going to be, get, be able to get a partial kit. And that's why Lazarus is particularly useful. You don't really need that many people to generate a kit. I compared uh, a few people, just myself, just to come out with a few numbers. The object is to get a kit that has at least 1,500 units of DNA in it. And if you do that, you're able to run it through the GEDmatch database and see who your ancestor matches on the database. You will be able to see their top 2,000 matches like you can for your own kit. <coughs> So when I compared myself, my paternal uncle and my second cousin, I was able to generate 2,027 units of DNA. So it's really not many people here that you're having to test, but by doing close relatives, it's given you that opportunity of producing that kit. So I do hear a lot of people saying to me, there's no point in me using a Lazarus, I haven't got enough people tested, but that's all it's going to take. Then I did a comparison with myself and just two of my own cousins and I still managed to get 1,730 units in a Lazarus kit for my mother. So that's particularly good. If you do generate over 1,500 units, it's called an LL kit, and it's given a number that begins with LL. As you know, every kit on Jetmatch has a prefix. Family tree DNA kits start with a T, etc. and Ancestry or A and whatever. But LL kits are Lazarus kits. Now when you're looking at your list of matches you won't see Lazarus kits because the matches on a Lazarus kit are only available to the person who generated the kit. And the reason that is is because if I made a mistake and I generated a kit that was incorrect and it appeared in your matches list you would think you were related to one of my ancestors and it wouldn't actually be a correct representation of DNA at all. So you wouldn't want to do that. So it's very good that only people who know the kit number can actually check it. You can also generate a Lazarus kit if you don't have that required amount of DNA. Now 1,500 is probably between about 20 and 40% of a normal DNA kit. But under that, it would be an LX kit. And what that means is you can only use it on one-to-one -one comparisons. So you can still compare an unknown match to one of your ancestors and see if you're getting a hit, if you're getting a match between those kits. But you can't run it through the database and see their top matches in the one-to-many on Jeb match. So just to give you another example now, this is photographs and the death notices of my great-grandmother, and that's her dates there. So I decided that I was going to try to create a Lazarus kit for my great-grandmother. I've already created kits for both of my parents and three of my grandparents. So I decided I was going to go for a great-grandmother. And in order to do that, I was able to find some matches myself through the various companies, persuade those matches to upload to Jedmatch, I also then tested members of my own family. And in order to get an extra person into group two, I volunteered to pay for uh, a third cousin to test. And that meant then that I had an extra person in group two that was going to give me the required comparison between group one and group two. Don't forget, group one is the descendants and group two is everyone else who's related to the person you're reconstructing but who is not a descendant. So I was able to find four descendants and I was able to find eight other relatives that I was able to put into group two. And that got me 1,544 units, which just got me over <laughs> the limit. But it's been a really useful kit. I've already been able to find some of my family tree DNA matches on there. And some of those people I now know are related to a particular great grandparent. So that is really narrowing down your field of research and in one uh, particular case, it helped me to identify that uh, one match did come through very strongly, and I knew that they, they probably had either a McVeigh or a black ancestor, because that was 
the parent in this case. And there was nothing on their tree to tell me that. I had found an email where I'd written to this person before. They had said they had no knowledge of this. But when I did a bit of research myself on their tree, because it then was drawn to my attention, I was able to find they did indeed have an ancestor called McVeigh, and they were from Northern Ireland, and I'm now currently working on connecting that up. I have a theory of how we connect, and I'm very nearly there. So, so uh, Lazarus will help you to identify people and to identify matches that would otherwise be further down your matches list that you wouldn't currently see. Another example of that is a case where I find a third cousin twice removed. When I looked at my GED match, he matched me for 45 units and was predicted at 4.2 generations back in time. When I looked at my uncle's kit, he matched him for 78 units. But when I looked and resurrected my, uh, my grandfather's kit, I got a match of 136 centimorgans. So that was telling me very strongly that he was related on that line. Again, he had no information on, so I found his tree on Ancestry and had the connection within a few minutes. I actually had his parents on my tree, but his parents had moved to England, and I was able to subsequently then find this connection and prove it. So this is just now going to show you exactly what you do with Lazarus, because you probably think there's an awful lot to do, and there's going to be a really complicated process putting this together, but it's not actually. It's very simple. You have to come up with a name for the kit. So that's going to be the name of the ancestor that you're currently reconstructing. You have to tick male or female, and you have to decide whether you want to generate a kit or not. If you want to play about with it and see how you do, then you'll do a trial run, and that means it won't generate a kit. If you generate a kit, it will take 24 hours to fully integrate with the GEDmatch database, just like a normal upload does. So that's the first section you have to do. So that can be done in seconds. Then you basically just put in kit numbers. So for group one, you put in the kit numbers of the people who are descendants. And for group two, you put in as many other relatives of that person as you have. Now the one thing that you have to be careful about is that you don't have people who are related in different ways to your family members. That's very important. If you do, you should leave them out. So if you have somebody who's related to you through your father and through your mother, and you're trying to reconstruct your mother's kit, then don't put in that particular person to the equation. Because if you do, it will bring through DNA from both of your parents into that reconstructed kit. And it's going to actually skew the results wrongly and give you incorrect matches to your Lazarus kit. So you do have to test it. You have to check every single Lazarus kit and make sure that it is matching the people you would expect to match and it's not matching people that you wouldn't expect it to match. So when you do that, you basically press the generate button and it does it for you within seconds. And you get three different tables. That is where you get the total amount of the Lazarus kit. It's at the bottom of table two, and it's very easy to miss. And that's why I put it on a slide there, as so as you can see where it is. You can copy those uh, particular tables if you want, because it's your only opportunity to see them. But if you didn't copy them and you wanted to do them, you could just run the kit again and take a copy of them then. As I said, the size of the kit is shown at the bottom of table two. The first table, will show you a comparison between each kit in group one and group two and show you which segments it has found. <coughs> group two is then going to show you a summary of all the different segments it has found on each chromosome. And table three is going to show you how the people that you have put into group one match the new kit that you have reconstructed. So as I said earlier, 24 hours to process a kit if you do manage to get over 1,500 units. So I just want to give you an example now of just how this translates into sentient organs and how it helps you with your DNA. So going back to the example of the lady I put up in the photograph, this is what I've been able to get just on that small kit, which just got me over the 1,500 threshold. This is 
in the first column you can see what people match to me in Cindy Morgan's on Jet Match. And this is the match that I got on my great grandmother's kit. So even though that's only based on between 20 and 40% of her DNA, I'm still getting stronger matches to known relatives. And that is also the case for unknown relatives. The examples that I've given here are people that I do know, but uh, you will find that if you look at your kit, as I did in uh, the other example I mentioned earlier, you will find that you, in a lot of cases, will have a smaller match than you will get on a reconstructed Lazarus match, even though it's not somebody's full DNA. The particular good use in this case for me was that this is my father's father's mother. And if anyone knows anything about X matches, males only get an X match from their mother. They don't get it from their father. So I was never going to know anything about my great grandmother's X matches. But through Lazarus, I'm able to get that information. And this is what I've been able to get on X match. I don't match anybody on X because these people are related to me through my father. But because my great grandmother is further up the tree, she does match people through females in the family. So you can see there that I'm getting some quite successful X matches. The entire X match on our odd jet match is I think 190. And a female would have two of those. And you can't tell whether you're getting a match on both sides or on one side. So I would assume that uh, that's at least 147 out of one of those chromosomes I've managed to recreate on my Lazarus kit. So that can be useful because then that means that I can go into Jed match, into her kit. I can organise the matches by the X matches and see who has the strongest X match. And that's given me another way of approaching my, my matches and trying to find connections. So what Lazarus is doing is it's making the segments larger by adding together all the bits that their descendants inherited. So bits will have come to you, to your siblings, they'll have come to your aunts and uncles, but they didn't all come to you. And this is why testing is very, very important. It gives you matches to a specific ancestor based on their DNA. And every time you find a new match, you are then able to rerun the Lazarus kit and add in their DNA. So therefore, that kit will become a bigger kit. You will get a different number. And what I would recommend to you is that you delete the old kit. Because if you don't, you will then have two Lazarus kit numbers for the same person, and you will not know which one is the most current one. And I've done it. So yeah, it's, it's very good to delete a kit whenever you're producing a new one. So as I said earlier, the smaller kits are very useful too because you can use them if they're under 1,500. But when I'm now testing someone, I'm thinking towards what use can I put this person's results? Will it be useful in common matches? Will it be useful to paint on extra matches onto DNA Painter? And will it be useful when I'm reconstructing a Lazarus kit? So it's a different way of thinking about your DNA and it can help you to make real progress. One drawback, as I said, make sure each person isn't related to you more than one way. When you generate a kit, ensure that you do testing. And testing means that you're going to do the comparisons I mentioned earlier, where you're going to be looking at comparing a kit to known relatives and to other people who shouldn't match the kit. Because there may be unknown connections in your family that this could help to reveal. There is a Facebook group on Lazarus, and that is very useful for asking questions and for finding out more information. But one thing that I've been thinking about recently is what future uses uh, Lazarus could be put to. And one thing that I've been thinking of is phenotyping. Now, Colin mentioned that in his presentation earlier. And what it can mean is reconstructing facial features from DNA. There's only one company that I'm aware of that's currently doing that. That's Powerbun uh, Nano Labs, and they're only doing it for government and law enforcement agencies. But it is currently being done, and at the moment it's taking 850 
SNPs in order to generate that. But as technology improves, it would be great to think that perhaps Lazarus kits could be used in the future to reconstruct facial likenesses. At the moment it can be used for face shape, for freckling, for eye colour, hair colour, and it's a particularly useful tool. So if that was able to be done, I think it really depends on particular SMPs being present in the kit. So I don't know where technology is going in the future, but I know that currently we're able to do things with our DNA that I wouldn't have thought was possible a few years ago. So I am hoping that facial reconstruction is going to be possible in Lazarus kits in the future. Okay, that's the most of what I have to say. Any questions? Thank you very much, Martin. Thank you. Great. Well, okay, I see, I see that we have questions already <laughs> popping up from the audience. So I'm going to come down to Jim Holland first and then Johnny. For the Lazarus kit for my mother and father who had passed away, I used my father's sister and my mother's sister. But you mentioned using your parent, and I'm trying to see how well a substitution will work. So far, I haven't been that successful, but do you have any recommendations from actually doing that? Option. Sorry, who would, you, who would you be trying to reconstruct? Well, I'm, tr I'm trying to, well, I created my father's kit with my three siblings. Yes. Myself and two siblings, and his sister. Okay. okay. Now I want to go back at least one more generation. Well, then what you can do is if you're recreating one of your grandparents, you can then use all the people who are descendants of your grandparents. So that means that your father's siblings would instead of being in group two, they will be in group one. So you'll be putting them into group one because they are descendant of your grandparent, and you will also be in group one because you'll be representing somebody different in the family. So you wouldn't be putting your father's kid in there. You'd be putting yourself in. So that's, that's leading me on to another point. If you have someone that you have tested and you've also tested their parent, you don't need to put in the child in that case because it, they're only getting their DNA from the person that you have already tested. So if you're reconstructing a grandparent and you have one of the children of that grandparent, you don't need to put in any children of that particular child. <coughs> That's making sense. Okay, so then... Uh... So in your example, you'd be putting in your, the children of your grandparent that you're going to try to reconstruct. You have to decide which one it is. So if you're maybe going for your father's father, you'd be putting in your aunts and uncles and yourself and your cousins into group one and into group two you'll be putting other people who are related to your father's father. Okay, I don't have those but I would have the uh, grandchildren. The grandchildren, right, that's not going to be any good if... In group two. Sorry, the gra no, you wouldn't put grandchildren into group two because they are descendants of the person that you're reconstructing. Everyone who's a descendant goes into group one. Okay. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Brief group group one is direct descendants. Yes. And group two is any other relative except direct descendants. So it would be aunts and uncles of the person that you're trying to reconstruct, or it could be a great nephew of somebody who you're at, who, uh, who you're trying to reconstruct. Johnny Pearl. I've got a, a very specific question. That I hope I can ask clearly enough. Um, it's about the specific case of half siblings. Yes. So my father has got um, a half sibling on each side tested. So obviously, um, if I was trying to recreate the DNA for one of his parents, either his father or his mother, um, all of the DNA he shares with each of those siblings could theoretically be attributable to that parent. But That's right. does Lazarus actually handle that and harness all of that DNA? Yes, it will. So, so I just put them both in group So if one. you're reconstructing your grandparent again, you'd yeah. be putting in the half-sibling and your father. Yeah. Because you already have tested them and you wouldn't be putting yourself in because, you, because there's no need to. Sure. And then the people I put into group two, um, even if they're quite remote, they'll still somehow that, that, that DNA that, that, that is kind of proved via the half sibling relationship, that, that would get into the kit. Yes, it well. would. But you do have to have, uh, you, it's good to have as many people in group two as possible. Of but course, yeah. they can't all be fully remote. They can't all be fourth and fifth cousins. You have to have somebody slightly closer. Yeah. Because the closer they are related to you, the more DNA they are going to share and the more uh, DNA it's going to pull through you into the Lazarus kit. Sure. And, and sorry to keep going on. Um, 
because i'm because my father's parents had a very different ethnic background there's a large number of unknown matches where even though i have no idea who they are i do actually know which side they're on so my right in thinking i can use them in groups yes some people do do that yeah. i haven't done that myself yet because i yeah. like to prove the connection first yeah. and i would recommend sure. that people do it in case there's unknown connections that people wouldn't be aware of, of course. but yes there is a lot of people that would make that assumption and maybe use their red and blue phasing on family tree DNA, work it out from that, and then they would put those people into GEDmatch if they can find them listed there. So yes, it is possible to do that. But again, I would test the kit very carefully to make sure that there wasn't any untoward results coming out of it. Indeed. Thank you very much. Thanks, Johnny. Right. We have a question back here. Thank you very much. Just a quick clarification, I think it relates to the question that the gentleman was asking earlier. So I'm trying to recreate my father's kit, and I have my mother tested, me and my sister, and a number of cousins. So am I right that at the moment there is no way to include my mother? That's right. There's not okay. on jet match, but if you use the map S facing, okay. you would be able to do so. That will be around. Okay. Did yeah. I, are there any plans to include that in, in uh, Lazarus' kit in Get Match? No, I think the initial plan was... From I have ever started to use it, it's never worked successfully. I don't think they ever really enabled it. Sure, they didn't. No, no, it's never worked. So the phasing, I tried the phasing kits, and that didn't work properly either. So yeah, it is going to be possible. I think it's possible already to use Lazarus on Jetmatch uh, Genesis. It is actually enabled now. Yeah, you can use it there as well. Thank you very much. I have first a comment regarding the tier one and the ten dollar price. The good thing about it is that those of us who don't get the opportunity to do this sort of thing all the time, you can pay for the ten dollar for a month, use it like crazy, and then if you can't use it again for six months, you don't have to pay for those six months. That's correct. You can just pay for it again later. Uh, I have a couple questions. The one question about putting your mother in when you're trying to reconstruct your father's is that to eliminate any things that would be on your mother's side? Well, that's what I said. Uh, the spouse field isn't working. Right. So, and yeah, you wouldn't... Yeah, but, 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 yes, that is the concept, and that's what you do on the map S phasing. And it works out, I think, at $14, $49 uh, dollars per year. So it's a very cheap price at the moment. Okay. So and it's well worth experimenting, and you could use the spice field there. If you have already created Lazarus, you've done that for somebody, and then you get a new match... What are you starting over again and putting in people you did the first time? You would be doing exactly the same, yes. I keep track in just a, a Word document of exactly who I've used to reconstruct a kit. And then when I find a new match, I would then look at that Word document and then build on from there. I'd put in those people again and then I would put in the additional person as well. Thank you. Okie dokie, we have uh, some questions down here from Dwayne. I generated an LL kit um, using Lazarus, but uh, when I tried to do one-on-one -on -one matching or um, or one-on-many -on -many using the kit, it said it wouldn't recognize the kit, and you can't see the kit numbers in your regular kits. Is there a trick? There? Yes, it could be that whenever you generated the kit, you didn't tick the box for full processing which means you have been experimenting with it and you have looked at the kit and you have been able to do something, but you're only really doing a test. You didn't actually generate it. So as you saw, whenever I had that screen up, but I think you can go back uh, there. Yeah, you had the test yeah. Uh, option yeah. versus... So yes, you have to go into full processing and then it takes 24 hours to integrate with the database. Once you do that, it will appear in your list of test kits on your homepage okay. on JetMatch. Uh, yeah, yeah, that's... A Good confirmation because it didn't appear in my list. And, you know, I was yes, that's that's what's happened in that instance. Thank you. Oh. Excellent talk, Martin. By the way, um, <laughs> thank you. One comment: in areas where there's a lot of admixture, does that not create a problem for the use of Lazarus kits? It can do, and that's why it's very important to test the kit at the end and see if you're getting matches that you shouldn't be getting. Okay. With regards to an older version of a Lazarus kit, would you not have the possibility to go in to, the, to edit the kit on the top page of GEDmatch? No. You don't? No. No, you have to rerun the kit again every time you <coughs> want to add DNA to it. Or if you don't find that it's a, a, a successful kit or something is on toward, you might want to play around and take one person out and then test it again to actually see if you're getting proper results out of it. I'm still relatively new about all this. I 
I'm gonna give you a scenario that you can maybe answer. So I, my dad is alive, I have his DNA, he's in uh, Jed Match. Uh, I wanted to know on a second cousin of his that I just discovered last week in Northern Ireland, I've met for the first time, she is the last remaining direct, direct blood link to my father's father's brother. Okay. Should I get her tested? Yes. And then... <laughs> yes. Okay. I, I didn't need to hear the end of what you were saying. It's just a yes. <laughs> no, but if you do put that person, that person will be in group two, and it will be particularly useful then if you're reconstructing one of your grandparents. Uh, thank you very much indeed. Fascinating. Uh, challenges of only children. I'm an only child. Okay. I managed to do it. <laughs> For a couple of generations. Uh, my father. Uh, 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 my father died in '92. My mother died in 2004. I couldn't test either of them. I had one paternal uncle that I was able to test, and two maternal uncles. Okay. So, so and so again, yeah, there wasn't very many people. But I'm actually having success in getting further back. I've got partial kits for even four times great grandparents. I've managed to get maybe four or five hundred units of DNA that I can then use as a tester. Whenever I get a new match coming in, I can just put them in, compare them against this particular four times great grandparent and say I get a match. So it can be used that way, even if you can't get to the 1,500. Question here from Paddy at the back of Waldron. I have a, co a complicated family. My grandfather was an identical twin, and just the other day I persuaded the other twin's granddaughter to swap. And I've already got a Lazarus kit from ages ago from my grandfather, and you reminded me I can add this new cousin when her results come in. Yes. And then you said make sure you don't include anyone who's doubly related. The identical twins married two sisters, but I don't think that's going to screw up. <laughs> <laughs> If they hadn't been married to two sisters, I would say that you could have put the identical twins' granddaughter into group one as a descendant, because they would be duplicating your grandfather's DNA. So you could reconstruct further back and put them into group one. That wouldn't work if there was also cousin marriages within the family. But surely as long as the people I put in group two are related to the twins and not related to their wives, should it make any difference? As long as they're not, yes, as long as they're not direct descendants, you, you, uh, you would really need to chart it out on a, on a family tree, check the actual lines of descent, and make sure there's no cross fertilization. <laughs> I'll be very careful when I'm doing it. <laughs> <laughs> very wise. Uh, any other questions? Yeah, we have a question from Debbie here at the front. Here we go. Observation, but there is a consortium called Euro 4 Gen, and they just recently released um, a panel of SNPs for forensic purposes for looking at things like eye colour and hair colour, and I think it's even things like hair shape, oh. and it will produce a, like a probabilistic um, estimate of you know whether they, it's green or blue or whatever eye colour. I'm not that there is a website. I haven't actually checked it out to see if you can actually use it if we're not in the forensics community, but um, I would hope that that's something that, you know, perhaps one day could be even incorporated yeah. into GenMatch. That would be excellent. Cool. Um, on that point, how, how likely is it, do you think, that we will actually be able to generate <coughs> photographs of our ancestors? Well, would you another assist in the room maybe we're going to ask? <laughs> well, maybe, Barbara, do you have any idea on that? Because um, Parabon have done that type of phenotyping um, with um, with various cases that they're working on, how accurate do you think those phenotypes actually are? It really varies a lot. Um, for example, I'm a Golden State Killer. I did not see the Paragon report while I was doing my stuff. And so, as you recall, one of my criteria for identifying Joseph D'Angelo was blue eyes. It turns out the Paragon report had him with green eyes. <laughs> <laughs> So it's only going to be an approximation then, most likely. <laughs> um, I've spoken to various people in the forensic community, and they are actually very um, sniffy about what parents do in the patient reconstruction. And I think there's somebody on Australia where they're trying to actually 
re-replicate what uh, Paragon is, is doing. Mm -hmm. um, so the Centre for Out Science produced a thing called Centre Pack Forensic Genetics, and they mentioned the, the Paragon work in there, but it's not really been properly validated or anything as yet. Mm -hmm. But I think there are still are possibilities in the future. <laughs> So it's a bit like ethnic estimates. Yeah. The, uh, <laughs> the, the photograph of your ancestor may change over time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Fine. Well, I, I think it's absolutely fascinating what you've shown us, and you've certainly opened my eyes to the possibility of recombining DNA from the people that have been tested to recreate these ancestors, and then putting that into the into GEDmat to to find much much more robust connections, if you like, with some of the matches that may, might be further down my match list and be lost in the morass of fourth, fifth, and sixth cousins. So um, I think you've given some, uh, some great ideas for, for thinking what we can do now with our own family tree. So thank you very much, Martin McCall. Thank you very much. I hope. Yes. Again, that Good. was all over the place. I tried the other one and it was not working very well. <laughs> Thank you very much for that. So the, uh, the next presentation will be from Andrew Millard in about 10 minutes' time. And uh, just to let everybody know, we are live streaming this on Facebook with the permission of uh, all of the speakers. Grand. Thanks, that was great. <laughs> oh, Martin, before you go away,